Chapter 30 The 5th of September, the extension provided for by the agent of Thompson and French, at the moment when Morrill expected at least, was to the poor shipowner so decided a stroke of good fortune that he almost dared to believe that fate was at length grown weary of wasting her spite upon him. The same day he told his wife, Emmanuel, and his daughter all that had occurred, and a ray of hope, if not of tranquillity, returned to the family. Unfortunately, however, Morrill had not only engagements with the house of Thompson and French, who had shown themselves so considerate towards him, and, as he had said, in business he had correspondents, and not friends. When he thought the matter over, he could by no means account for this generous conduct on the part of Thompson and French towards him, and could only attribute it to some such selfish argument as this, we had better help a man who owes us nearly three hundred thousand francs, and have those three hundred thousand francs at the end of three months than hasten his ruin, and get only six or eight per cent of our money back again. Unfortunately, whether through envy or stupidity, all Morrill's correspondents did not take this view, and some even came to a contrary decision. The bills signed by Morrill were presented at his office with scrupulous exactitude, and, thanks to the delay granted by the Englishman, were paid by Cockles with equal punctuality. Cockles thus remained in his accustomed tranquillity. It was Morrill alone who remembered with alarm that if he had to repay on the 15th the 50,000 francs of M. de Beauville, and on the 30th the 32,500 francs of bills, for which, as well as the debt due to the inspector of prisons, he had time granted, he must be a ruined man. The opinion of all the commercial men was that, under the reverses which had successively weighed down Morrill, it was impossible for him to remain solvent. Great, therefore, was the astonishment when at the end of the month he cancelled all his obligations with his usual punctuality. Still confidence was not restored to all minds, and the general opinion was that the complete ruin of the unfortunate shipowner had been postponed only until the end of the month. The month passed, and Morrill made extraordinary efforts to get in all his resources. Formerly his paper, at any date, was taken with confidence, and was even in request. Morrill now tried to negotiate bills at ninety days only, and none of the banks would give him credit. Fortunately, Morrill had some funds coming in on which he could rely, and, as they reached him, he found himself in a condition to meet his engagements when the end of July came. The agent of Thompson and French had not been again seen at Marseilles, the day after, or two days after his visit to Morrill, he had disappeared, and as in that city he had had no intercourse but with the mayor, the inspector of prisons, and M. Morrill, his departure left no trace except in the memories of these three persons. As to the sailors of the Pharaon, they must have found snug berths elsewhere, for they also had disappeared. Captain Gomard, recovered from his illness, had returned from Palma. He delayed presenting himself at Morrill's, but the owner, hearing of his arrival, went to see him. The worthy shipowner knew, from Penelin's recital, of the captain's brave conduct during the storm, and tried to console him. He brought him also the amount of his wages, which Captain Gomard had not dared to apply for. As he descended the staircase, Morrill met Penelon, who was going up. Penelon had, it would seem, made good use of his money, for he was newly clad. When he saw his employer, the worthy tar seemed much embarrassed, drew on one side into the corner of the landing-place, passed his quid from one cheek to the other, stared stupidly with his great eyes, and only acknowledged the squeeze of the hand which Morrill, as usual, gave him by a slight pressure in return. Morrill attributed Penelon's embarrassment to the elegance of his attire, it was evident the good fellow had not gone to such an expense on his own account, he was, no doubt, engaged on board some other vessel, and thus his bashfulness arose from the fact of his not having, if we may so express ourselves, worn mourning for the pharaoh longer. Perhaps he had come to tell Captain Gomard of his good luck, and to offer him employment from his new master. Worthy fellows, said Morrill, as he went away, may your new master love you as I loved you, and be more fortunate than I have been. August rolled by in unceasing efforts on the part of Morrill to renew his credit or revive the old. On the 20th of August it was known at Marseilles that he had left town in the mail coach, and then it was said that the bills would go to protest at the end of the month, and that Morrill had gone away and left his chief clerk Emmanuel and his cashier Cockles to meet the creditors. But, contrary to all expectation, when the 31st of August came, 
the house opened as usual, and Cockles appeared behind the grating of the counter, examined all bills presented with the usual scrutiny, and, from first to last, paid all with the usual precision. There came in, moreover, two drafts which M. Morrill had fully anticipated, and which Cockles paid as punctually as the bills which the shipowner had accepted. All this was incomprehensible, and then, with the tenacity peculiar to profits of bad news, the failure was put off until the end of September. On the first, Morrill returned, he was awaited by his family with extreme anxiety, for from this journey to Paris they hoped great things. Morrill had thought of Danglars, who was now immensely rich, and had lain under great obligations to Morrill in former days, since to him it was owing that Danglars entered the service of the Spanish banker, with whom he had laid the foundations of his vast wealth. It was said at this moment that Danglars was worth from six to eight millions of francs, and had unlimited credit. Danglars, then, without taking a crown from his pocket, could save Morrill, he had but to pass his word for a loan, and Morrill was saved. Morrill had long thought of Danglars, but had kept away from some instinctive motive, and had delayed as long as possible availing himself of this last resource. And Morrill was right, for he returned home crushed by the humiliation of a refusal. Yet, on his arrival, Morrill did not utter a complaint or say one harsh word. He embraced his weeping wife and daughter, pressed Emmanuel's hand with friendly warmth, and then going to his private room on the second floor had sent for cockles. Then, said the two women to Emmanuel, we are indeed ruined. It was agreed in a brief council held among them that Julie should write to her brother, who was in garrison at Nîmes, to come to them as speedily as possible. The poor women felt instinctively that they required all their strength to support the blow that impended. Besides, Maximilian Morel, though hardly two and twenty, had great influence over his father. He was a strong-minded, upright young man. At the time when he decided on his profession his father had no desire to choose for him, but had consulted young Maximilian's taste. He had at once declared for a military life, and had in consequence studied hard, passed brilliantly through the polytechnic school, and left it as sub-lieutenant of the 53rd of the line. For a year he had held this rank, and expected promotion on the first vacancy. In his regiment Maximilian Morrill was noted for his rigid observance, not only of the obligations imposed on a soldier, but also of the duties of a man, and he thus gained the name of the Stoic. We need hardly say that many of those who gave him this epithet repeated it because they had heard it, and did not even know what it meant. This was the young man whom his mother and sister called to their aid to sustain them under the serious trial which they felt they would soon have to endure. They had not mistaken the gravity of this event, for the moment after Morrill had entered his private office with cockles, Julie saw the latter leave it pale, trembling, and his features betraying the utmost consternation. She would have questioned him as he passed by her, but the worthy creature hastened down the staircase with unusual precipitation, and only raised his hands to heaven and exclaimed, Oh, mademoiselle, mademoiselle, what a dreadful misfortune! Who could ever have believed it? A moment afterwards Julie saw him go upstairs, carrying two or three heavy ledgers, a portfolio, and a bag of money. Morrill examined the ledgers, opened the portfolio, and counted the money. All his funds amounted to six thousand or eight thousand francs, his bills receivable up to the fifth to four thousand or five thousand, which, making the best of everything, gave him fourteen thousand francs to meet debts amounting to two hundred and eighty-seven thousand five hundred francs. He had not even the means for making a possible settlement on account. However, when Morrill went down to his dinner, he appeared very calm. This calmness was more alarming to the two women than the deepest dejection would have been. After dinner Morrill usually went out and used to take his coffee at the club of the Focines and read the semaphore, this day he did not leave the house, but returned to his office. As to Cockles, he seemed completely bewildered. For part of the day he went into the courtyard, seated himself on a stone with his head bare and exposed to the blazing sun. Emmanuel tried to comfort the women, but his eloquence faltered. The young man was too well acquainted with the business of the house not to feel that a great catastrophe hung over the moral family. 
Night came, the two women had watched, hoping that when he left his room Moral would come to them, but they heard him pass before their door, and trying to conceal the noise of his footsteps. They listened, he went into his sleeping room, and fastened the door inside. Madame Morrill sent her daughter to bed, and half an hour after Julie had retired, she rose, took off her shoes, and went stealthily along the passage to see through the keyhole what her husband was doing. In the passage she saw a retreating shadow. It was Julie, who, uneasy herself, had anticipated her mother. The young lady went towards Madame Morrill. "'He is writing,' she said. They had understood each other without speaking. Madame Morrill looked again through the keyhole, Morrill was writing, but Madame Morrill remarked, what her daughter had not observed, that her husband was writing on stamped paper. The terrible idea that he was writing his will flashed across her, she shuddered, and yet had not strength to utter a word. Next day M. Morrill seemed as calm as ever, went into his office as usual, came to his breakfast punctually, and then, after dinner, he placed his daughter beside him, took her head in his arms, and held her for a long time against his bosom. In the evening, Julie told her mother that although he was apparently so calm, she had noticed that her father's heart beat violently. The next two days passed in much the same way. On the evening of the 4th of September, M. Morrill asked his daughter for the key of his study. Julie trembled at this request, which seemed to her a bad omen. Why did her father ask for this key which she always kept, and which was only taken from her in childhood as a punishment? The young girl looked at Morrill. What have I done wrong, father, she said, that you should take this key from me? Nothing, my dear, replied the unhappy man, the tears starting to his eyes at the simple question, nothing, only I want it. Julie made a pretense to feel for the key. I must have left it in my room, she said. And she went out, but instead of going to her apartment she hastened to consult Emmanuel. Do not give this key to your father, said he, and tomorrow morning, if possible, do not quit him for a moment. She questioned Emmanuel, but he knew nothing, or would not say what he knew. During the night, between the 4th and 5th of September, Madame Morrill remained listening for every sound, and, until three o'clock in the morning, she heard her husband pacing the room in great agitation. It was three o'clock when he threw himself on the bed. The mother and daughter passed the night together. They had expected Maximilian since the previous evening. At eight o'clock in the morning Morrill entered their chamber. He was calm, but the agitation of the night was legible in his pale and careworn visage. They did not dare to ask him how he had slept. Morrill was kinder to his wife, more affectionate to his daughter, than he had ever been. He could not cease gazing at and kissing the sweet girl. Julie, mindful of Emmanuel's request, was following her father when he quitted the room, but he said to her quickly, Remain with your mother, dearest. Julie wished to accompany him. I wish you to do so, said he. This was the first time Morrill had ever so spoken, but he said it in a tone of paternal kindness, and Julie did not dare to disobey. She remained at the same spot standing mute and motionless. An instant afterwards the door opened, she felt two arms encircle her, and a mouth pressed her forehead. She looked up and uttered an exclamation of joy. "'Maximilian, my dearest brother,' she cried. At these words Madame Morrill rose and threw herself into her son's arms. "'Mother,' said the young man, looking alternately at Madame Morrill and her daughter, "'what has occurred, what has happened?' Your letter has frightened me, and I have come hither with all speed. Julie, said Madame Morrill, making a sign to the young man, go and tell your father that Maximilian has just arrived. The young lady rushed out of the apartment, but on the first step of the staircase she found a man holding a letter in his hand. Are you not Mademoiselle Julie Morrill? inquired the man, with a strong Italian accent. Yes, sir, replied Julie with hesitation, what is your pleasure? I do not know you. Read this letter, he said, handing it to her. Julie hesitated. It concerns the best interests of your father, said the messenger. The young girl hastily took the letter from him. 
She opened it quickly and read, Go this moment to the Alis de Mailhan, enter the house number 15, ask the porter for the key of the room on the fifth floor, enter the apartment, take from the corner of the mantelpiece a purse netted in red silk, and give it to your father. It is important that he should receive it before eleven o'clock. You promise to obey me implicitly. Remember your oath. Sinbad the Sailor the young girl uttered a joyful cry, raised her eyes, looked round to question the messenger, but he had disappeared. She cast her eyes again over the note to peruse it a second time, and saw there was a postscript. She read, It is important that you should fulfill this mission in person and alone. If you go accompanied by any other person, or should anyone else go in your place, the porter will reply that he does not know anything about it. This postscript decreased greatly the young girl's happiness. Was there nothing to fear? Was there not some snare laid for her? Her innocence had kept her in ignorance of the dangers that might assail a young girl of her age. But there is no need to know danger in order to fear it. Indeed, it may be observed that it is usually unknown perils that inspire the greatest terror. Julie hesitated and resolved to take counsel. Yet, through a singular impulse, it was neither to her mother nor her brother that she applied, but to Emmanuel. She hastened down and told him what had occurred on the day when the agent of Thompson and French had come to her father's, related the scene on the staircase, repeated the promise she had made, and showed him the letter. "'You must go, then, mademoiselle,' said Emmanuel. "'Go there?' murmured Julie. "'Yes, I will accompany you.' But did you not read that I must be alone? said Julie. And you shall be alone, replied the young man. I will await you at the corner of the Rue du Musée, and if you are so long absent as to make me uneasy, I will hasten to rejoin you, and woe to him of whom you shall have cause to complain to me. Then, Emmanuel, said the young girl with hesitation, it is your opinion that I should obey this invitation? Yes. Did not the messenger say your father's safety depended upon it? But what danger threatens him, then, Emmanuel? she asked. Emmanuel hesitated a moment, but his desire to make Julie decide immediately made him reply. Listen, he said, today is the 5th of September, is it not? Yes. Today, then, at eleven o'clock, your father has nearly three hundred thousand francs to pay? Yes, we know that. Well, then, continued Emmanuel, we have not fifteen thousand francs in the house. What will happen then? Why, if today before eleven o'clock your father has not found someone who will come to his aid, he will be compelled at twelve o'clock to declare himself a bankrupt. Oh, come, then, come, cried she, hastening away with the young man. During this time, Madame Morel had told her son everything. The young man knew quite well that, after the succession of misfortunes which had befallen his father, great changes had taken place in the style of living and housekeeping, but he did not know that matters had reached such a point. He was thunderstruck. Then, rushing hastily out of the apartment, he ran upstairs, expecting to find his father in his study, but he rapped there in vain. While he was yet at the door of the study, he heard the bedroom door open, turned, and saw his father. Instead of going direct to his study, M. Morel had returned to his bedchamber, which he was only this moment quitting. Morel uttered a cry of surprise at the sight of his son, of whose arrival he was ignorant. He remained motionless on the spot, pressing with his left hand something he had concealed under his coat. Maximilian sprang down the staircase and threw his arms round his father's neck, but suddenly he recoiled and placed his right hand on Morel's breast. Father, he exclaimed, turning pale as death, what are you going to do with that brace of pistols under your coat? Oh, this is what I feared, said Morel. Father, father, in heaven's name, exclaimed the young man, what are these weapons for? Maximilian, replied Morel, looking fixedly at his son, you are a man, and a man of honor. Come, and I will explain to you and with a firm step Morel went up to his study, while Maximilian followed him, trembling as he went. 
Morrill opened the door and closed it behind his son, then, crossing the anteroom, went to his desk on which he placed the pistols and pointed with his finger to an open ledger. In this ledger was made out an exact balance sheet of his affairs. Morrill had to pay, within half an hour, 287,500 francs. All he possessed was 15,257 francs. Read, said Morrill. The young man was overwhelmed as he read. Morrill said not a word. What could he say? What need he add to such a desperate proof in figures? And have you done all that is possible, father, to meet this disastrous result? asked the young man, after a moment's pause. I have, replied Morrill. You have no money coming in on which you can rely? None. You have exhausted every resource? All. And in half an hour, said Maximilian in a gloomy voice, our name is dishonored. Blood washes out dishonor, said Morrill. You are right, father, I understand you. Then extending his hand towards one of the pistols, he said, there is one for you and one for me, thanks. Morrill caught his hand. Your mother, your sister. Who will support them? A shudder ran through the young man's frame. Father, he said, do you reflect that you are bidding me to live? Yes, I do so bid you, answered Morrill, it is your duty. You have a calm, strong mind, Maximilian. Maximilian, you are no ordinary man. I make no requests or commands, I only ask you to examine my position as if it were your own, and then judge for yourself. The young man reflected for a moment, then an expression of sublime resignation appeared in his eyes, and with a slow and sad gesture he took off his two epaulets, the insignia of his rank. Be it so, then, my father, he said, extending his hand to Morrill, die in peace, my father, I will live. Morrill was about to cast himself on his knees before his son, but Maximilian caught him in his arms, and those two noble hearts were pressed against each other for a moment. You know it is not my fault, said Morrill. Maximilian smiled. I know, father, you are the most honorable man I have ever known. Good, my son. And now there is no more to be said, go and rejoin your mother and sister. My father, said the young man, bending his knee, bless me. Morrill took the head of his son between his two hands, drew him forward, and kissing his forehead several times said, Oh, yes, yes, I bless you in my own name, and in the name of three generations of irreproachable men, who say through me, the edifice, which misfortune has destroyed, providence may build up again. On seeing me die such a death, the most inexorable will have pity on you. To you, perhaps, they will accord the time they have refused to me. Then do your best to keep our name free from dishonor. Go to work, labor, young man, struggle ardently and courageously, live, yourself, your mother and sister, with the most rigid economy, so that from day to day the property of those whom I leave in your hands may augment and fructify. Reflect how glorious a day it will be, how grand, how solemn, that day of complete restoration, on which you will say in this very office, My father died because he could not do what I have this day done, but he died calmly and peaceably, because in dying he knew what I should do. My father, my father, cried the young man, why should you not live? If I live, all would be changed, if I live, interest would be converted into doubt, pity into hostility, if I live I am only a man who has broken his word, failed in his engagements, in fact, only a bankrupt. If, on the contrary, I die, remember, Maximilian, my corpse is that of an honest but unfortunate man. Living, my best friends would avoid my house, dead, all Marseilles will follow me in tears to my last home. Living, you would feel shame at my name, dead, you may raise your head and say, I am the son of him you killed, because, for the first time, he has been compelled to break his word. The young man uttered a groan, but appeared resigned. And now, said Morrill, leave me alone, and endeavor to keep your mother and sister away. Will you not see my sister once more? asked Maximilian. A last but final hope was concealed by the young man in the effect of this interview, and therefore he had suggested it. Morrill shook his head. 
I saw her this morning and bade her adieu. Have you no particular commands to leave with me, my father? inquired Maximilian in a faltering voice. Yes, my son, and a sacred command. Say it, my father. The house of Thompson and French is the only one who, from humanity, or, it may be, selfishness, it is not for me to read men's hearts, has had any pity for me. Its agent, who will in ten minutes present himself to receive the amount of a bill of 287,500 francs, I will not say granted, but offered me three months. Let this house be the first repaid, my son, and respect this man. Father, I will, said Maximilian. And now, once more, adieu, said Morel. Go, leave me, I would be alone. You will find my will in the secretaire in my bedroom. The young man remained standing and motionless, having but the force of will and not the power of execution. Hear me, Maximilian, said his father. Suppose I were a soldier like you, and ordered to carry a certain redoubt, and you knew I must be killed in the assault, would you not say to me, as you said just now, Go, father, for you are dishonored by delay, and death is preferable to shame. Yes, yes, said the young man, yes, and once again embracing his father with convulsive pressure, he said, Be it so, my father. And he rushed out of the study. When his son had left him, Morel remained an instant standing with his eyes fixed on the door, then putting forth his arm, he pulled the bell. After a moment's interval, Cockles appeared. It was no longer the same man, the fearful revelations of the three last days had crushed him. This thought, the house of Morel is about to stop payment, bent him to the earth more than twenty years would otherwise have done. My worthy cockles, said Morel in a tone impossible to describe, do you remain in the antechamber? When the gentleman who came three months ago, the agent of Thompson and French, arrives, announce his arrival to me. Cockles made no reply, he made a sign with his head, went into the anteroom, and seated himself. Morel fell back in his chair, his eyes fixed on the clock, there were seven minutes left, that was all. The hand moved on with incredible rapidity, he seemed to see its motion. What passed in the mind of this man at the supreme moment of his agony cannot be told in words. He was still comparatively young, he was surrounded by the loving care of a devoted family, but he had convinced himself by a course of reasoning, illogical perhaps, yet certainly plausible, that he must separate himself from all he held dear in the world, even life itself. To form the slightest idea of his feelings, one must have seen his face with its expression of enforced resignation and its tear-moistened eyes raised to heaven. The minute hand moved on. The pistols were loaded, he stretched forth his hand, took one up, and murmured his daughter's name. Then he laid it down, seized his pen, and wrote a few words. It seemed to him as if he had not taken a sufficient farewell of his beloved daughter. Then he turned again to the clock counting time now not by minutes, but by seconds. He took up the deadly weapon again, his lips parted and his eyes fixed on the clock, and then shuddered at the click of the trigger as he cocked the pistol. At this moment of mortal anguish the cold sweat came forth upon his brow, a pang stronger than death clutched at his heartstrings. He heard the door of the staircase creak on its hinges, the clock gave its warning to strike eleven, the door of his study opened. Morel did not turn round, he expected these words of Cockles, the agent of Thompson and French. He placed the muzzle of the pistol between his teeth. Suddenly he heard a cry, it was his daughter's voice. He turned and saw Julie. The pistol fell from his hands. My father, cried the young girl, out of breath, and half dead with joy, saved, you are saved and she threw herself into his arms, holding in her extended hand a red, netted silk purse. "'Saved, my child,' said Morel, "'what do you mean?' "'Yes, saved, saved.' "'See, see,' said the young girl. Morel took the purse, and started as he did so, for a vague remembrance reminded him that it once belonged to himself." At one end was the receipted bill for the 287,000 francs, and at the other was a diamond as large as a hazelnut, with these words on a small slip of parchment, Julie's dowry. Morel passed his hand over his brow, 
it seemed to him a dream. At this moment the clock struck eleven. He felt as if each stroke of the hammer fell upon his heart. Explain, my child, he said, explain, my child, he said, explain, where did you find this purse? In a house in the Allies de Mailhand, number 15, on the corner of a mantelpiece in a small room on the fifth floor. But, cried Morrel, this purse is not yours. Julie handed to her father the letter she had received in the morning. And did you go alone? asked Morrel, after he had read it. Emmanuel accompanied me, father. He was to have waited for me at the corner of the Rue du Musée, but, strange to say, he was not there when I returned. Monsieur Morrel, exclaimed a voice on the stairs, Monsieur Morrel. It is his voice, said Julie. At this moment Emmanuel entered, his countenance full of animation and joy. The Pharaoh, he cried, the Pharaoh. What, what, the Pharaoh? Are you mad, Emmanuel? You know the vessel is lost. The Pharaoh, sir, they signal the Pharaoh. The Pharaoh is entering the harbor. Morrel fell back in his chair, his strength was failing him, his understanding weakened by such events, refused to comprehend such incredible, unheard of, fabulous facts. But his son came in. Father, cried Maximilian, how could you say the Pharaoh was lost? The lookout has signaled her, and they say she is now coming into port. My dear friends, said Morrel, if this be so, it must be a miracle of heaven. Impossible, impossible. But what was real and not less incredible was the purse he held in his hand, the acceptance receded, the splendid diamond. Ah, sir, exclaimed Cockles, what can it mean, the pharaoh? Come, dear ones, said Morrel, rising from his seat, let us go and see, and heaven have pity upon us if it be false intelligence. They all went out, and on the stairs met Madame Morrel, who had been afraid to go up into the study. In a moment they were at the Canabier. There was a crowd on the pier. All the crowd gave way before Morrel. The Pharaoh! The Pharaoh, said every voice and, wonderful to see, in front of the Tower of St. Jean, was a ship bearing on her stern these words, printed in white letters, the Pharaoh, Morrel, and son, of Marseilles. She was the exact duplicate of the other Pharaoh, and loaded, as that had been, with cochineal and indigo. She cast anchor, clued up sails, and on the deck was Captain Gommard giving orders, and good old Penilon making signals to M. Morrel. To doubt any longer was impossible, there was the evidence of the senses, and ten thousand persons who came to corroborate the testimony. As Morrel and his son embraced on the pierhead, in the presence and amid the applause of the whole city witnessing this event, a man, with his face half covered by a black beard, and who, concealed behind the sentry box, watched the scene with delight, uttered these words in a low tone, Be happy, noble heart, be blessed for all the good thou hast done and wilt do hereafter, and let my gratitude remain in obscurity like your good deeds. And with a smile expressive of supreme content, he left his hiding place, and without being observed, descended one of the flights of steps provided for debarkation, and hailing three times, shouted, Jacopo, Jacopo, Jacopo. Then a launch came to shore, took him on board, and conveyed him to a yacht splendidly fitted up, on whose deck he sprung with the activity of a sailor, thence he once again looked towards Morrel, who, weeping with joy, was shaking hands most cordially with all the crowd around him, and thanking with a look the unknown benefactor whom he seemed to be seeking in the skies. And now, said the unknown, farewell kindness, humanity, and gratitude. Farewell to all the feelings that expand the heart. I have been heaven's substitute to recompense the good, now the god of vengeance yields to me his power to punish the wicked. At these words he gave a signal, and, as if only awaiting this signal, the yacht instantly put out to sea.